This is uh, Morten from English TV, and uh, today we are with Saikon in Lier in uh, Belgium. And in a moment you will see a, it's a huge machine, it's called Adia, and uh, Adia is uh, basically a new corrugate machine. I'm talking to Daniel, who is, uh, you're the, are you the product manager for the product, or what is your role here? Well, so my role is uh, that I take the overall responsibility of the program at Saikon, so that means that uh, I'm held accountable for everything that runs from the product itself, so the development of the product, to the installation of the product at the customer, to uh, the marketing and the sales efforts, and obviously also the operational part. So it's it's the whole thing. It's quite amazing, and I mean, when you look at it, it's it's. I mean, you can see that it's still work in progress, right? But I mean, why did you think about this? Because it's it's a totally different machine from the other cycle machines we know, right? No, very much so. I mean, it's obviously a lot bigger, and it is an aqueous uh, inkjet machine, which is different from what we normally do, because normally we do either dry toner or we do UV inkjet. Mm. But why did we do that? Well, if you take a step back, Zycon is part of Flint Group, and Flint Group is really strong in the corrugated industry. So we knew that industry, uh, we have lots of customers out there, we know their demands, mm. Uh, and then you have Zycon who understands digital printing. So one plus one, we felt like, hey, that makes uh, that makes a good combination. And and I take that it's not just a good combination from a Flint and from a Zycon perspective, but it's also uh, basically listening to one of the most important trends that you see in, in the graphics arts industry is uh, 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 private labeling, uh, smaller print runs, faster turnaround time, and maybe even higher quality, right? Oh yeah. So all that obviously helps a lot. Uh, we we really think that with digital printing in core that we are, well, we're probably a little bit past uh, early stage, but we're in a ramp up phase because now you see that brands and retailers, who in the end are the owners, value the fact that they can react quickly, uh, that they can do quick uh, design changes, that they don't need to keep uh, incredible amounts of stock, uh, but also the printers converters who are our customers, our direct customers, see that there are a lot of in, uh, inefficiencies in their existing process. Because if you take a Flexo uh, press, for example, change over time tends to be relatively long. Especially because, I mean, if you look at the demand of higher, I mean, brand owners want the best quality. And, and, and with a Flexo press, the more forms you need to create a beautiful uh, separation of a printed product, uh, it, the longer time it takes to set it up, right? Absolutely. Just, just, to, just to touch on the topic of, of best quality, let's never ever forget that, that quality is always a function of A, how it looks, eh, obviously, but also how quickly can you get it to the market and how much flexibility can you offer in the design and what else can you do on top of a, of, of a nice design. Because if you, for example, have a very nice design, but you can only supply it after 12 weeks, and as such, the, your base product is, uh, is, is, is going to waste in the factory, then it doesn't really make a lot of sense. If you, for example, want to do something with regard to variable data or you want to have a QR code... Yeah, because I was just about ooh. to ask, I mean, because, I mean, there is a tendency to use variable data in packaging as well. I mean, uh, you, you can have QR codes for tracking, but you can also have it for marketing purposes and customer engagement and all those things that we know from packaging, how it is, is with the change of the Amazon effect that basically it needs a lot of changes in how we actually produce the things, right? So is that like, when you look at the, uh, the market, I mean, of course you have investigated into the market if there's a need for such a product. What, what is the initial reactions when you start talking to people about this? Well, the funny thing is that all those nice add-ons that we're talking about, so variable data, design changes and the like, in the beginning don't really matter. Okay. What, they, what matters much more in the beginning is whether somebody can take existing work off a conventional press, say it's a, it's a flexo press or it's an offset press, and put it on a digital press, and as such start, can start to free up capacity on, an, on their existing equipment. Mm. Because what they see is that they lose downtime on their existing presses because they have all those changeovers as run lengths are going down. And I was just thinking as extension to what you're saying is basically that if you have like a huge corrugate, whether, whether it's a, a flexo or an offset press, if you have too many short runs, you can really not utilize the long runs that you need. So this is something where you can do the short runs and free up time on the for the uh, on the capacity on the flex or on the offset press is that how it should, should be seen exactly and, and the other thing is that with with uh, this press i mean this for example here's a four color uh, a four color press the one in the us there we have six stations so you have the uh, the possibility to go further so you can add colors as basically customer demands or 
Yeah. To some extent, of course, right? Yeah. Indeed, to some, to some extent. But the, the basic idea is that here, with four colors, with CMYK, you can cover actually a color gamut that sits pretty close to what you can reach with a six or a seven color press. Be simply because the pigments are better than if you look at, at analog uh, printing technology. It's simply that, uh, well, it's, I'm not really saying that the, 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 the pigments are better, but you have more, you have more room to play okay. with. Because uh, you, can, you can control the drop better and basically make sure that you have higher screening and all those things. Yeah, yeah. especially in the pre-press, we see a lot of additional uh, possibilities that we have. And that's one of the nice things of Zycon. I mean, we have been in digital printing for 25 years. You invented it, so basically, the, at least the industrial part. That's of a it, big right? claim, eh? <laughs> I have got it from Danny, and he actually have a book saying it, so, uh, and he's standing all there, so he would know, right? Uh, Daniel, I was just thinking, um, when you do a machine like this, uh, it's it's pretty, quite big, of course. Uh, what sizes uh, of sheets can it take, and uh, is speed something that is important here as well? Or, I mean, tell us a little bit about the, the value proposition from a product perspective. Yeah, so when we started this, we, we started from a slightly different perspective than, than, than many of the other guys. So what we saw competition doing is that, that they went for the, what I would call the really high quality kind of print, yes, to transfer uh, offset LIFO to, uh, to digital. Well, if you want to do that, you need to have a very expensive press because you need to have great print heads, you have to have great registration and the like. But at the very same time, you have to ask yourself, okay, what percentage of the market is actually sitting there? And we feel it's very, very, very small. Especially the, on the corrugator, right? Because if we spoke folding carton, it would be different, right? Yes, yeah. there, there it will obviously be different. Yeah. So what we, fe what we felt is like, no, we rather want to do a play on operational flexibility. So how can we help a printer converter to be flexible in its operations? So what you want to, want to do is you want a press that is easy to use, because we all know how difficult it is to get uh, people recruited. Uh, the, the, the old operators of, of long back that really know how to Tw tweak and tune a press, they're, they're gone or they're retiring. So you want to have an easy press. Then you want to have a press that is very adaptable. And what do I mean by that? Indeed, for example, you can have different sheet sizes, you can de uh, print different kind of, de of designs and the like. And on top of that, you want to have a press that is sustainable. And what does sustainable mean? For, for me, it's two things. One, it's a sustainable from an economic perspective, mm -hmm. so that you have the right uh, cost of print. Mm -hmm. But secondly, also that you use the right ingredients so that you don't uh, uh, put too much um, uh, burden on the uh, on the thing, environment. Yeah, and so, I mean, if we just spoke to uh, Benoit just uh, an hour ago, and basically, it seems that it's very much into the DNA of uh, Cycon to have a very clear path on the sustainability agenda. So, what you say here is this is mach this machine is for the packaging industry something that can create. Uh, Beautiful products, uh, uh, easy to uh, set up uh, 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 and, and change overs, but it's also a sustainable solution when it comes to the packaging. Products. Absolutely, because what you need to bear in mind is that there is quite a lot of uh, waste in the in the corrugated packaging industry, mm -hmm. because with a flexo press, you're always going to run more sheets than than required, because you just want to you just want to make sure that you don't have to rerun a small lot. And you also need to be sure that when you go to the finishing part, that you don't run out of uh, of uh, stock. So you always produce not just for set up the colors, but also for the finishing part afterwards. Right? Exactly. Yeah. With this price, you can you can print the exact uh, the exact amount. Yeah. So th 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 that is a gain. Then you have indeed the setup part that you lose. What is nice about this press as well, you can also run the sheets in two directions. So um, depending on the design that you have, you can, you, can, you can switch the board so that you can make use of the 1.6 meters wide that we have here. Uh, and you have two, 2.8 meters in, uh, in, in, in throw length. Mm -hmm. So you can take a, a, quite a big sheet if, uh, if needed. So you can play with that. Mm -hmm. Another cool thing is that, for example, drying. I mean, we're talking about a water-based inkjet press. Mm -hmm. So people would be like, oh my God, that's a whole lot of uh, water that needs to get out of the print. Well, that's to a certain degree true, but the nice thing is that paper sucks up yeah. the ink. And with the corrugate, you basically have a, I would say, a layer where you are less, if, I mean, if you have a very thin substrate, you're more, you're more cautious about the water level on the paper, right? But here, I take that you can control it better. Absolutely. So, so we can, with, with uh, ink clipping and the liking, we can really make sure that we only apply what is truly necessary. Mm. 
The other thing is that, and I just wanted to mention that with regard to the drying, is, have you, is that if you have an uncoated substrate, we hardly need any drying at all. And that really lowers the energy consumption that you have. So especially on uncoated, you're very, very good from an, uh, from a, from an ecological footprint perspective. Yeah, because basically the uh, let's say if you look at the foot, uh, the, the, the carbon footprint on this machine is basically the, the heating on the dryers, right? And that is like... Uh, That's the main part. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But I heard from one of your colleagues just before uh, that, that actually the heating, you recirculate the heating basically to again keep the, 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 the energy consumption as low as possible. Is that what did I hear right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Correct. Yeah, so yeah. that's one of the nice things about it. So if you look at the infrared tunnel, and we, we can have a little walk yeah, uh, past the press definitely. after a while. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, do that now, right? Okay, yeah, because he's just not, uh, because I probably spoke with you five minutes already, but I'm excited about what you see. No, <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah. So, so what we do, for example, is that just come with me like this, yeah, yeah. Um, is that we uh, we recirculate the heat that is being generated in the infrared drying part mm -hmm. because we have two drying parts. We yeah. have uh, a hot air dryer which mm -hmm. is being re recirculated out of the infrared dryer, mm -hmm. and then we have the infrared dryer, mm -hmm. and. Um, what we also do is that we, for example, only have the heaters on in that part where it makes sense. Mm. So if a board is, say, a meter wide, mm. why would you put all your heaters on uh, over 1.6 meters? Precisely. So, so you can basically adapt the... Yeah, the, you the, shrink the yeah, whole yeah. thing. Before we go to that, because basically now we are here at the machine, so we have, first you have a primer here. And, and it is a working environment here where you're basically still developing the machine. So just for people to understand that this is like... We are, we are in a development site, right? Absolutely. Okay. So we are here in, uh, in Lear at, at the Zycon facility. So we use this press for basically for two purposes. One purpose is to, uh, to give demos and benchmarks so that customers understand where we are. Uh, and secondly, it's a development press. Yeah. And it's not only development that we do ourselves, but also with partners because oh, nice. uh, mm -hmm. you need partners. I mean, in the end, uh, what we're looking for is an ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, where we do certain things. Eh? Uh, so for example, here we do the press, uh, we do the software, we can provide the service to the customers. Mm -hmm. But peripherals like a stacker, mm -hmm. we are not the ones that are gonna reinvent Somebody the wheel. Somebody has done it before, right? Absolutely. Is that the same with the primer? And uh, just before we, you answer, maybe you can answer that in the same, because I mean, the primer, the purpose of that is of course to make sure that you have good uh, uh, colors on, on your substrate. Does that mean that you can pretty much use any kind of material for this machine? Uh, from a primer perspective, yeah. you mean? I mean, I mean, I was just thinking that when you have the primer on, it's basically to make sure that the the the, the inks are, are are getting on 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 the surface in a good shape and Absolutely. quality. But I was just thinking that since you prime all the sheets, can you basically use any kind of corrugated material for this machine, or is it limited to a certain type of material? We can basically use any kind of material, be it coated, uncoated, or semi a, a semi coated material. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, though, you obviously do see differences in terms of print quality. I, I can imagine, but so, that is like what we see on all machines anyway, so that is probably a fair, fair thing to talk about anyway, right? Yeah, and then why do we use a primer? Well, we use a primer, first of all, to, to expand our window, mm -hmm. so we can use, uh, use our inks on more sheets and have a, a, a nice uh, image. Yeah. But secondly, it also helps to reduce the ink consumption. Because so basically, you, because it doesn't have to go into the sheet, you can basically make sure that you have exactly the amount of colors uh, or inks you need for, for, the, for the corrugated. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the pigment stays nicely on top mm. of, the, uh, of the surface, yeah. and as such, you have that color density that you want to have on your packaging. So you get the, the gamut you need, basically. Right? So here we have the, the printing machine. I mean, as you said, this is a four-color uh, edition here. So when you have the machine like this, basically you just add, just <laughs> add separate units for more colors, like the one you have in the US? Yeah, correct. So it's, it's almost like Lego in the sense that, uh, and, and this press still doesn't have it, uh, but on the, on the new ones we do have it. So you have a major, you have uh, rails, mm. you have on both sides of the press you have a rail, mm. and you basically uh, uh, put the elements on top of it. Mm. Can you open one and maybe just sure. see how it looks inside? Or? Yeah. What I'll do is I'll also open an, uh, a cabinet. Yeah. So this is where you have the pumps and the con no, that's not the control electronics is on the on the printheads in themselves, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. But so is that is that the vacuum you control, or it's just feeding the the inks to the printheads from there, or? So what we have here is we have basically everything that is required for the uh, for the circulation of the inks. So what do you want to have? You want to make sure that the ink that keeps on floating around is clean. So you have filters here. 
And the other thing you want to have is you want to avoid having any air bubbles in the ink because they may end up in your, in your print head and that affects your print head and your print quality. So we also have degasses sitting here. Mm. Each of the ink stations is exactly the same. Mm. Yeah? So again, we have our, 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 our Lego system. Uh, here you have four and you can simply add them on top of that. Mm. Um, how difficult is it to make things like this? I mean, if you look at a machine like this, is, is I mean, you're obviously a huge machine. Uh, when you started developing a technology for corrugated, is it the inks, is it the consistency of print, or what, what is the biggest challenge in developing a machine like this, in your opinion? Oh, I'm, uh, now I may start offending certain people in R&D, so uh, <laughs> I find it a tricky one. But <laughs> I, would, I would personally argue that the, the, that the trickiest part are the inks, uh, inks in combination with the primers. Okay. Because, oh, because they need to, of course, work uh, uh, coherently good with each other. Yeah. Exactly, and uh, you have that ecosystem, that kind of holy trinity. You have a print head, you have a substrate, and you have an ink, yeah. and uh, uh, sitting in the print process, and that that just needs to work perfectly well. Yeah. Not only once, because let's face it. I mean, having a nice sample is something we can all do, do if we take sufficient time. Yeah. Uh, but time and time again, in a reliable way, uh, I think that is probably the biggest challenge. But it's here and it's working, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, fantastic. So let's uh, move a little bit further down here. Um, obviously, uh, as you said, it's a kind of a Lego brick system. So basically, each of the uh, of the color units are the printing units are basically the same, right? Yes, indeed. So in in this case, we print from light to uh, to dark. Yeah. So here we have the black station. Yeah. Um, you are not obliged to do so, but we've, we, we have best results that way. Yeah. Um, there is a vacuum system sitting under it um, to, that holds the board, because other than in the flexor and offset, we obviously, uh, obviously print from the, from, the, uh, from, 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 uh, from the top rather than from the bottom. Yeah. And now uh, we have the, the printed, printed sheet, and basically now here we get into the drying timers, right? Yes. And, this, uh, and you see the belt uh, running there. Uh. Yeah, so the reason why we have two belts rather than one continuous belt, as you may, as you may expect, um, is that you want to have very good registration uh, in the printing section. And since you don't want to have a very long belt, because the longer the belt, the bigger the likelihood that you have a uh, stretch and skew on the belt. On top of that, as soon as you go into a drying section, you have different temperatures. Um, so you can control the temperature across the bar, basically? Or? Yes, we, we, we do control the temperatures in, in the drying sections. But we also have a different um, belt system there because you don't want to have wear and tear on a very expensive belt that's sitting in the print section. So this is the part that we talked about earlier where we recirculate the heat from so the infrared and it, oh, goes it goes back, back here. in here. Oh, okay, so that's where it goes. Okay, so is it, uh, is it like a, a vacuum where you take the heat out of it? Exactly. And basically, yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. And so uh, here we see the, 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 the heaters again, yeah. But the, okay, so that, is a, that was, a, what, what did you call that one over there? Uh, that's that the was the uh, hot air. That's, yeah. a, that's the hot air. This yeah. is the infrared. Infrared, okay. Yeah, okay. so under here we have lamps that go across the width. And then depending on the width of the sheet, we can... Uh, turn it on and off, basically. We can automatically turn it on and off. Yeah. An operator doesn't have to worry about these kids. Uh, this is my, the computer hands it for you. Exactly. So yeah. as, lo as long as the, as the press knows, okay, I'm going to have this job, so that there's this sheet with this thickness, this width, this length, uh, the, the rest can go for itself. The only thing that the, that the operator needs to do mm. is either set a pre-feeder, mm -hmm. in case there's a pre-feeder, or set a feeding table. Yeah. The rest goes for itself. Okay. And um, I mean, there's a lot of components in a machine like this. Is, uh, is it difficult also to make sure that your computers can control everything, or is that actually, simple engineering? Or actually, most of it is just done uh, through software. That's the nice thing about yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. And here, then you have like uh, this is the coder, basically. No, that's yeah. This yeah, is a varnish station. Varnish thing. Yeah. Yeah. What we see is that uh, for certain customers, there are quite some re requirements with regard to, uh, for example, slip and, uh, and rub off resistance. Yeah, I would just say because, uh, I mean, especially when it's Aquarius uh, technology, it, it has a little bit easier of getting rubbed off uh, uh, compared to UV, for example. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. So um, some, some, of the, uh, uh, of, uh, some of the prospects that we talk to, they actually prefer to have nearly everything coded yeah. uh, simply to be safe. 
but that, stra that station is here yeah. just to be uh, just to be safe and again have the flexibility yeah. so an operator or probably better said the pre-press departments mm. can really decide how they want to have it run mm. um, what are the DPI settings? What are the speeds? Uh, so that's set by pre-press pre people, basically. Well, there, there are two philosophies out mm. there, right? Mm. Certain people say that uh, the operator should have quite some flexibility to decide for himself. Other printers, converters are like, no, 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 no. It has to be green button. By so, the time that it reaches the press, yeah. it is just push on the button and have it run. So basically that gives a lot of advantages when we spoke about labor situation. But also basically if you want to have a machine that runs you know, the same type of jobs day in and day out, you basically have the opportunity to set it up to run almost without any people, right? Absolutely, and what is the nice thing is that as soon as you have run a job, you can store the job and make sure that you can always go back, use the very same settings and rerun it. And, and be that sure way, that you have the same basic. Indeed, uh, yeah, yeah. it's one on one. Yeah. And that is different from a conventional press where very oh, yeah. often you still have that, that, that little tweaking that yeah, needs yeah. to be done. Yeah, yeah. And now you can just run it exactly the same parameters. And then you have the ski jump hill here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is actually quite a big one. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is provided uh, by uh, one of our partners. So this is Duker. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a simple uh, down stacker. I wouldn't say simple. Uh, it's still a nice piece of engineering. Yeah. The reason why uh, we have actually quite uh, a lovely uh, ski jump, as you call it, <laughs> is because we, uh, we can stack up to 2.1 meters high. Yeah, and again, as I, I spoke also to one of your colleagues before, I mean, because, I mean, it's the, the substrate on corrugated is thick, but it doesn't have a high weight. So you basically want to fill up the palace with as much as possible. Right? Absol yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. and, and, and what, what, has, what has been a very nice thing out here is that uh, we can integrate the whole thing with uh, with our workstation. Ah, so, so it actually has more controls on the electronic side compared if you just had like a pure analog uh, stacker basically. Well the big advantage is that for example if you have a sh if you do a, 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 a sheet change mm. you have those parameters also being uh, uh, wire uh, transferred to your stacker. Mm. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. mm. Uh, obviously, there's also integration from a safety perspective. Yeah. Uh, if you have an e-stop situation somewhere along the line, it's all integrated yeah. uh, so that you don't end up with funny situations. Last thing, uh, uh, two things I would like to ask you about. One thing is that if you look at the layout of the machine, is that, uh, I mean, when you, when you decide to have a machine this length and how it's made and how this actually works, is that how the, um, the uh, converters and, and, the, and the printing companies want this to be or I mean because I, th I take that you know it's like when you have an electrical vehicle you don't have to put the engine in front of it right you can put it anywhere basically right so I was just thinking that when we now have this digital transformation does that give new opportunities how to make the layout more f operator friendly and things like that or yes but you always you're still having some constraints yeah you have constraints in the uh, in the factory Transport, of course yeah in the factory of course. because uh, over there very often uh, the space you get is say um, eight meters wide 40 meters long mm. and you have to fit everything in between yeah um, but I think from I was uh, just a little bit curious because you know sometimes Digital gives new opportunities, so I was just curious about it. So I think it gives opportunities, especially around uh, around working on the press, in that it is uh, it's a much cleaner environment. It's easier. Mm. Um, it's much more software driven, mm. and as such, I think it really speaks to a different generation. Mm. You no longer need to have the the old printer. The blue workers have changed, been changed out with with uh, I don't know what they're called when they are not blue workers, but I mean it's not like the typical blue worker anymore, right? No, yeah. no, 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 not at all. And I think we need that. The other thing that obviously sooner or later I think will happen is that we're going to get so much more control throughout the print process that we can start reducing the number of people mm. uh, and maybe even go to situations where one, one or two persons can run mm. two or three processes simultaneously. Yeah. So um, from uh, a, again, uh, economic perspective, I mean, how fast is it? Is it a good ROI? Is it, is it replacing uh, offset uh, and the flex or where do you see it from that perspective? I mean, let's start the speed. How fast is it? Uh, well, it depends a, a little bit on the substrate that, you, that you're going to okay. be running. Okay. Um, we say that on coated substrates, we, we, we tend to run at 60 meters per minute. 
and on uncoated substrate, depending on the quality that you, that you go for, mm -hmm. uh, we can run up to 100, 120 meters per minute. And how does that compare to analog? Is it slower or is it about the same speed? Or It's still somewhat slower than okay. analog. But still because you save all the setup time and, and because you have the, the, the better, better flexibility, it makes up for that speed basically? Or Oh yeah, so what we, what we still see is that you're able to, uh, to get a crossover point. Again, depending a little bit on the design, how much f uh, flexor stasis you need to change, Mm. how much ink you are going to put on the substrate and the like, you can get, uh, can get crossover points that are sitting between seven and a half to 10,000 sheets. Mm. Uh, and if you look at, at, at a, a factory nowadays in the US and in Europe, and you start counting the number of jobs that they have that are sitting below, say, seven and a half thousand sheets. That's a lot or? That's substantial, okay. that's really substantial. And that is, as, as we started talking about in the beginning, is basically that all the changes from, from the consumers and from the retailers uh, from the market is basically acquiring new ways of, and now the technologies can can cope with it, right? Because I think that, you know, one thing is that what is demand is driven by the customers, but it's also technology enables customer demand, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's a nice thing that is going on, is that brands and retails are starting, uh, starting to become aware mm. of the fact that digital can offer something new. Mm. Because in the past, they just had to stick to they a design. They had to stick to whatever they wanted to do. They could either do one color fast or they could do four colors slow, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, last thing, I promise you. Uh, the, oh, the, you the, the, the market situation, uh, right now, digital and corrugated is not so much competition, right? I, I see there is a few uh, competitors right now, but how do you see uh, 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 Cycon in, in that competitive field? I think we have a very nice position because we uh, we really position ourselves somewhat uh, differently. So first of all, we are a water-based solution that has been a very conscious decision because we believe that longer term, the uh, requirements around food compliance and the requirements around the cost of print will drive the markets towards, towards water-based. So for us, UV, yes, I mean, you get some very nice shiny designs on UV, uh, especially in, in, in display. Don't get me wrong, it has its benefits, but we felt that for packaging, it's water-based. So uh, there already with very few competitors were sitting in that, uh, that space. Secondly, we are not shooting for the super duper quality, we rather go to a customer and try to help that customer to become operationally more efficient, more flexible. So we have a different attitude there. Um, and thirdly, I think we can really benefit from the fact that we are part of Flint Group. Um, uh, not only because uh, we can leverage Flint Group from a buying power perspective, uh, through the inks and the like, but also the, no the know-how that we get through Flint on substrate, on customer uh, demands and the like. And just imagine, for example, that a customer is now running lots and lots of jobs on, fl on Flint inks, and he wants to transfer them to, uh, to digital. Well, actually, we know exactly how those jobs are gonna like, uh, are, are looking like. We know the requirements that they have in terms of abrasion, uh, uh, gluing, and the like. So you can that use really that helps. also in the ROI calculations, basically, because there is, of course, a difference in, in, in the costing of inks, but because you know the customers and how they consume and what they use in, in, in conventional print today, you can easily make that calculation for them. At least we, uh, at least we think so. Okay. Uh, That's great. Daniel, thanks so nice much. talking to you. Thanks, thanks so much for your time. It was, uh, it was a pleasure. And in case any of your colleagues or your customers and partners have any further questions, happy to answer them. I'm sure they will. Thank you very much. Cheers.